The topic is general principles of periodontal surgery. Now, before we can go ahead with performing a periodontal surgery, it becomes important that we follow certain principles of uh, uh, surgery. Now, you can introduce all the surgical procedures should be carefully planned. So, before you can do any surgical procedure, you need to plan your surgery. Whether whether this, per this particular patient is fit for surgery or not. If he is fit for surgery, then what kind of a surgical technique that you want to incorporate. And then what kind of an anesthetic technique that you want to use. What kind of an anesthesia or local anesthesia. Whether you want to use it with adrenaline, without adrenaline. If you need to take some extra precautionary measures. If he has some communicable diseases or a, a disease which can be transmitted from one individual to another. So you all these things plus you have to keep a set of emergency equipment ready in hand with you in order to uh, solve any of the en emergency situations that you can encounter during the surgical procedures. Now let's go and you also need to prepare the patient psychologically, mentally and you, you need to and physically with all the constraints so that you don't suffer during your periodontal procedures. Now, what is the protocol that you should follow for an outpatient surgery? Now, these are the list of uh, protocol that you need to follow. We will go into detail about each of the protocol. They are listed from 1 to 13. The first one being patient preparation, followed by the emergency equipment, and then measures to prevent transmission of certain infections like your HIV or hepatitis B, etc. And then sedation and anesthesia, followed by tissue management, scaling, root planing, your hemostasis, your periodontal dressings or periodontal packs, and then post-operative instructions that you should give your patient. The first post-operative week, the immediate first week after the surgery, the removal of pack and return visit of the patient, mouth care between the uh, procedures and then management of post-operative pain. Now let's see the first protocol that is your patient preparation. Now you need to re-evaluate after the phase 1 therapy. You know that you do your phase 1 therapy that is your scaling and root planing and the other uh, methods like incorporating some uh, antimicrobial rinses or any host modulation therapy or any minor orthodontic movements or splinting or provisional splinting or uh, performing any kind of uh, occlusal corrections etc. Now all these come under your diet control. Yeah, that is one more important uh, uh, feature of your phase 1 therapy. So all these come under your phase 1 therapy also called as your preparatory phase, your non-surgical phase, cost related therapy or the initial phase therapy. Now all these are the synonyms for your preparatory phase or the phase 1 therapy. Now once uh, you do your phase 1 therapy, now by performing a phase 1 therapy you are going to attain a, a environment which is inflammatory free. So before you can perform any surgical procedure on your gingival tissues, you should make sure that all the tissues are firm and healthy and they are not inflamed and they are not bleeding because if the tissues are inflamed by just giving an incision it's going to be very difficult to get a sharp knife margin and then handling of the tissues is going to be a lot of problem and then visibility accessibility again is going to be hampered by a lot of blood that is going to come out from an infl inflamed tissue that's why you need to eliminate all the early lesions as possible during your phase one therapy apart from that your phase one therapy will give you tissues with a good firm and consistent nature of the tissues so that you can work with more precise accuracy. Apart from that, you can also get an acquaintance with the patient. At the first visit, the patient comes to you, he gets a little uncomfortable. But then as the number of visits increase, the patient gets more comfortable with the dentist. Now, what all do you do in the re-evaluation phase after your phase 1 therapy? You need to re-evaluate the periodontal status. You need to re-evaluate the patient's oral hygiene maintenance. You need to re-evaluate the patient's psychology. You re-evaluate the gingival status of the tissues and then check for all the periodontal findings and, and, and decide at this point of time whether you want to perform a surgery or not. Sometimes what happens is even after a good phase 1 therapy, all the findings of all the periodontal findings might resolve. So this is the exact stage that is a re-evaluation stage is a stage where you actually decide if the findings are still persistent with the, uh, uh, the periodontal findings are still persistent, then you go ahead by doing your periodontal surgery. Now before that, you can also give your patients or put the patients on some pre-medication drugs like prophylactic use of antibiotics. Some cases wherein the patient is suffering from an infective endocarditis, it is always advisable that you put the patient on a prophylactic antibiotics before you can even touch the patient. And then apart from that, some also uh, some authors have also told that by giving antibiotics before your surgical 
uh, suppose tomorrow you have posted the patient for surgery, you start your antibiotic coverage just maybe two days or one day prior to your uh, surgical uh, uh, appointment. And that will probably will reduce the amount of bacteremia that is going to happen post-surgery. Apart from that, you can also put your patients on non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, especially ibuprofen, just one hour before your procedure so that he would be a little bit pain-free even after the completion of the procedure. Apart from that, you can give the patient on your, uh, put the patient on your oral mouth rinses, that is 0.12 or 0.2% of chlorhexidine. The 0.12% is still not available in India. 0.2% of chlorhexidine would be the preferable chlorhexidine gluconate mouth rinse that you can advise the patient as a form of pre-medication. Apart from that, you need to advise all your patients who are smokers to quit the habit of smoking at least three to four weeks after the surgery. The patients who are not willing to quit the habit of smoking, you better consider another treatment plan before going ahead with the surgery because we know that smoking and periodontal disease, smoking and periodontal surgery has no proper benefits if you're, even if the, if the patient is not going to quit the habit of smoking. The next comes an informed consent. Now, all these are a part of your patient preparation. Now, informed consent. What is an informed consent? You need, now you have to take an informed consent at two particular visits. First is at the initial visit where you diagnose the case, you determine the prognosis and you draw a treatment plan for the patient. Now, you tell the patient that you are suffering from so-and-so disease. You tell, now this is the prognosis for the en entire dentition of your mouth and this would be the prognosis which are for the individual prognosis which are affected by your certain teeth. Now, and then you tell him the treatment plan that you have to go ahead with. Then take a consent from the patient or get an agreement from the patient that yeah, you have been explained, he's been told about the diagnosis, prognosis and the treatment uh, possibilities that he's been given to. Okay, This is very important that an informed consent is taken even at the initial visit. Then at the uh, surgery or on the day of surgery, again, you have to inform the patient that you are performing so-and-so surgery at that particular uh, area and then explain him what all you're going to do and then take an informed as well as a written consent from the patient. Then comes your second protocol that is your emergency equipment. It's always advisable that you keep in handy all the emergency equipment possible because you don't know at what point of time what emergency you can get during your surgical procedures or during your dental appointments. So you need to train the operator, you need to train your assistant and you need to train all the office personnel about this emergency management. Okay, the drugs and equipment of emergency should be available at all the times. Now let's see the most common emergency that is encountered during your surgical procedure or during your dental appointments. The first important or the most important one would be the syncope. Now what is syncope? It is nothing but a transient loss of consciousness, okay, mainly because of reduced cerebral blood flow. Now this is explained, it is not a loss of consciousness, it is transient loss, meaning to say just for a short period of time because the blood doesn't reach the brain for uh, because it gets stagnated at the peripheries. So what you need to do, first you need to identify the signs and symptoms of your syncope. First you need to know uh, uh, what is the cause for the syncope. Most of the time the cause for syncope would be because of fear or kind of an anxiety, dental anxiety or the treatment modality anxiety. So what do you do? You identify the signs. The most important signs would be the feel. The patient would start feeling weak. He would feel pallor. He would look more pallor. Then there would be sweating and the, the extremities would become cold. And apart from that, he would feel, he would say, he would complain of that he's feeling dizzy. And then you check for the pulse. It starts slowing down. And then apart from that, most of the times the patient will start you can you can observe more amount of the sclera so that would be an addict and uh, ideal sign that he might be going into syncope how do you manage the patients who are going into syncope first thing is first lower the chair completely you make the patient lie in a supine position and then you make sure that the legs are raised much above the head now this will help in the return flow of your blood back to the brain but that will reduce the loss of uh, consciousness and then apart from that, you loosen the tight clothes and then make sure that the airway is clear and then administer if oxygen if possible, if needed. And then unconscious patients, this unconscious state of 
condition would be just for very small period of time, hardly a few minutes. Now, if the patient, if you feel the patient is still not recovering, and always, yeah, always make sure that you make an eye contact with the patient and you keep conversing with the patient because you should not let the patient fall off into unco unconscious state. So you keep conversing with the patient and then you make sure that he's still coming, he's coming back to his senses. If still he's not coming back to senses, the best import, the best thing what you can do is you can uh, use a piece of cotton dip it in spirit which contains ammonia and then just keep it near his nose now that will constantly stimulate your brain centers and then he would pick up the uh, uh, state of consciousness that would be one of the good uh, remedies for treating syncope apart from that you also make sure that first you take if about you take a history about any of his previous syncopal attacks during the dental appointments so you get a history so you can be extra cautious over him Apart from that, the next protocol would be your measures to prevent the transmission of infections. Now, you should always treat any patient who enters your dental clinic as infectious because you really don't know whether the patient has what kind of an infection. So you better treat any patient who enters your dental clinic as an infectious patient and then you take the protective protocol needed as bad uh, as uh, in order to prevent any of the infections uh, reaching you or the infections from you spreading to him or any kind of a cross contamination for that please use all the barrier techniques that are available to you the universal precautions include your protective attire and then your barrier techniques like your disposable sterile gloves and then your surgical mouth mask and then your protective eyewear Apart from that, you need to make sure that all surfaces which are contaminated with blood and saliva are kindly, are, are, are at point sterilized. The ones which are contaminated with aerosols, you make sure that you wear all the protective eyewear and then be, keep a little distance away from the patient before you can treat. Apart from that, the special care is needed for sharp instruments like your needles, knives or uh, periodontal knives or your blades. So you make sure you take an extra care regarding these sharp instruments. The next protocol comes your sedation and anesthesia. Now some patients would be more anxious, okay? They can, they, they might be suffering from fear and anxiety. So now in order to treat these patients, probably you can give some anti-anxiety drugs so that the anxious state comes down. Now, some patients can also be treated under conscious sedation. And apart from that, the local anesthetic techniques which are available. If you want to, in, uh, you, if, if you want to treat some uh, handicapped or a, or a very uncooperative patient probably you can put him on a general anesthesia and then you can go ahead with the surgery apart from that your local anesthetic uh, local anesthesia is the most commonly preferred anesthetic uh, uh, anesthesia that is used in dent for all the dental procedures you know you have to decide whether you want what kind of a patient uh, is whether he's a little medically compromised or whether he he's suffering from any of the systemic illnesses like hypertension or uh, whether he has any thyroid problems so you need to decide whether you want to give a local anesthesia with adrenaline or without adrenaline now sometimes the patient give, might give you a history of an allergy to your local anesthetic so now that also plays a very important role that what to what drug is he allergic to if he allergic to one particular group of local anesthetics probably you can switch on to the other chemical group of local anesthetics and apart from that the next protocol would be your tissue management now you have to make sure that you handle the tissues very delicately now they are though your gingiva is supposed to be the most forgiving tissue of the oral cavity but still you need to make sure that you operate gently and carefully and then you need to make sure that you observe the patient at all times always keep in a conversation with the patient so that he doesn't suddenly go off to syncope and you don't even realize that he's gone to syncope okay and then you make sure that your, all your instruments are sharp no using blunt instruments if you're going to use blunt instruments you're going to be too tired by the time you give an incision because it, it, it's everything is going to be uh, hampered and coming to the next protocol that would be your scaling and root planing so you do a thorough scaling root planing following that you uh, uh, you raise a flap and you finish off the flap surgical procedure now during your procedure the most important thing would be hemostasis now you know when you're doing a surgical procedure you're going to get a lot of blood okay but then you need to make sure that this blood that is coming out should be under control. Now, if you're not, what are the techniques of uh, hemostasis that you can uh, apply in patients who are bleeding too much? 
Now, this hemostasis, the first thing, if you're able to achieve a good hemostasis, it will help you in finishing off your surgery fast. And then secondly, it will help you in a better visibility of the area. And then a proper, uh, you, you will get to know what is the extent of the disease. And then the pattern of bone destruction, the anatomy and the condition of the roots. Now, this, that's why it's very important that you need to visualize or uh, to get a good access to your surgical site. When do you call it as a good hemostasis? When, it, uh, when there is prevention of loss of blood and the patient is uh, constantly swallowing the blood into the oropharynx. Okay. Periodontal surgery, you know, it can induce a lot of bleeding now during your initial incisions and your flap reflection. But after flap reflection, the uh, bleeding will stop once you have removed your granulation tissue. The bleeding will disappear. The co control of intraoperative bleeding can be managed by aspiration, that is your continuous suctioning, or else application of uh, pressure. Bleeding from medium or large vessels, you can. Or how do you manage this? If you know that you have cut some large vessel or a medium-sized vessel, you're gonna be, you're gonna get lot of oozing. Not, not you're gonna have lot of spots, kind of a bleeding. So how do you manage this? Either probably you have to suture this, the uh, bleeding ends of the artery. Okay, or else you can uh, try applying a lot of pressure. Most of the times it can't just be merely controlled with pressure. Probably you can also use your electrocautery instruments. Then excessive bleeding, mainly due to incisions across the capillary plexus, can be controlled by applying some cold pressure using some pressure packs like ice packs. Okay, you can also use local anesthesia and you can also give local anesthesia with, with a vasoconstrictor. But then this is stri strictly not uh, advisable because you can't predict the amount, uh, because the effect of uh, local anesthesia with a vasoconstrictor is just for a short period of time. So you don't know later the, the, the area might start start bleeding more so that's why it's not relied for a long-term hemostasis probably just to visualize the area from or the site from where the bleeding is coming from maybe just to get a clear view of the area you can give local anesthesia with vaso vasoconstrictor just for a short period of time for a slow constant blood flow that is oozing what are the hemostatic methods that you can use and the list is given here the one would be the absorbable gelatin sponges your oxidized cellulose your oxidized regenerated cellulose your microfibrillar collagen and your thrombin now, all these are the hemostatic agents which are available which you can use now, coming to the next protocol your periodontal dressings now you've finished your surgery you've controlled the bleeding you've given the sutures the next one would be your periodontal pack now, what is the importance of periodontal pack now these periodontal packs actually by themselves they don't have any kind of healing factors rather they just protect the wound from an external surface so that no food comes in contact with them during the mastication so it basically providing a protection to the area of surgery there are various packs which are available. You have the eugenol packs and you have the non-eugenol packs. It was a eugenol packs which came up uh, first and then they saw that this eugenol has some uh, allergic, it, 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 it was, it would, uh, it had induced some allergic reactions in the host. Therefore, and some burning sensations have also been reported. Therefore, they've shifted from the eugenol to the non-eugenol packs. The first non-eugenol pack was, is called the Copac. Okay. And, uh, sorry the the zinc oxide eugenol pack the first one was given by ward in 1923 it's called the wonder pack and then non-eugenol packs include your copac wherein you have a reaction between your metallic oxide and fatty acids now it is supplied in two, two tube forms the tube one contains the following list that is your zinc oxide you have your oil for plasticity you have your gum for cohesiveness and then you have lorothiodol which is a fungicide your tube two uh, sorry, your tube two has uh, your tube two has lo uh, liquid coconut fatty acids, your colophony resin, and your chlorothymol, which is a bacteriostatic agent. Now, other non-eugenol packs include your cyanoacrylates and your tissue conditioners, which include your methacrylate gels. Now, part after after you've mixed your pack, then you, what ha what you need to consider is your retention of your packs. Now that we will discuss during the manipulation of the pack. Now apart from that, you also have your antibacterial properties. Certain antibiotics have been added in order to check the antibacterial properties of the copac, but which has not been that very successful because it didn't give any extra benefits. How do you prepare and how do you apply the dressing? First thing, you need to take equal ropes of both the pastes. 
of both the tube uh, paste and then you mix it uh, till you get a homogeneous mix once you have got a homogeneous color of the mix then you place it in a uh, uh, dish or a petri dish of saline and then wait for it to get a, a dovey consistency once you've got a dovey consistency you make a long ropes and till uh, how much of a length of uh, suppose you're doing a maxillary right quadrant so you make a rope length of the entire uh, quadrant size and then start applying the pack from the distal most area and then slowly apply the pack by moving the cheeks so that your uh, pack will get adapted onto the tooth surfaces and the tissue surfaces and then slowly you can spread the pack towards your palatal aspect and then join it and then in order for the retention of the pack you can interlock it at the interdental areas now your pack extension you should make sure that your pack is restricted only to the area of surgery now probably it can cover a little bit of the cervical portion of the tooth and then the uh, maybe a little bit into the tissues uh, for about maybe around two to three millimeters and then it, you make sure that it doesn't extend too much apically into the vestibular areas or too much into the onto the occlusal surfaces. This is because if it's going to extend or it's going to cover the occlusal surfaces, then it's going to interfere with the occlusion. So if it's going to extend too much apically, then it can cause certain ulcers in your vestibular area. What are the post-operative instructions that you give the patient after your surgery and then you and then you before you send him home? The post-operative uh, instructions include that you, you have to tell your patient first thing is not to brush the area of surgical procedure. You give him, uh, you prescribe him some antimicrobial rinses and then you tell him to use the rinses. You make sure that you describe, you tell the patient that he doesn't eat anything hard, anything soft. Uh, uh, sorry, you tell the patient not to eat anything hard, spicy and hot food for a while and then you uh, ask him to have something cold immediately after your uh, surgical procedure so that you can get a, a vasoconstrictive property of your cold food. Apart from that, you tell him uh, he has to come back to you after one week for the suture removal and for the pack removal. And then you tell him if there is going to be a little bit of bleeding if, that he's going to notice, then you advise him that nothing to worry. You just ask him to uh, remove the pack and then place a cotton and then try to uh, or else you can just ask him to apply pressure on the pack for a period of time and then you can ask him to evaluate if the bleeding is still persisting. If not, then he can um, he can go ahead with the other regular activities. If the bleeding is still persisting, then he can call back to the dental office and attend to the uh, dental appointment. On the first post-operative week, now the, you, you've finished the surgery, you've sent the patient with the instructions, then after one week, the patient has come to you. What all do you check for? You check if there is any persisting bleeding even after surgery. You check if for the sensitivity to percussion, you check the presence of any swelling or any feeling of weakness. Now, some experience a washed out effect that is a weakened feeling about 24 hours after surgery. This represents a systemic reaction to a transient bacteremia, which is induced or introduced by the procedure. It can be prevented by pre-medication with amoxicillin of about 500 milligrams every eight hours, beginning 24 hours before the next procedure and continuing the antibiotic for about five days post-operatively. And then what do you do? You remove the pack and then you ask the patient for a return visit. And then you check the mouth care between the procedures and then management of post-operative pain. How do you manage? Predorbital surgery that follows the basic principles produces only minor kind of a pain and discomfort. The common source of post-operative pain when you are overextending the periodontal pack. So overextended packs can cause localized areas of edema, usually noticed one to two days after the surgery. So removal of the excess pack is followed by resolution of that pain and ulcers, just an edema, just in about 24 hours. Extensive and excessively prolonged exposure and dryness of the bone can also induce severe pain. Now, severe post-operative pain, when do you notice? When the patient to be attended on, if, if the patient has severe pain, then you have to attend the patient on an emergency basis. You anesthetize the area by infiltration and topically, and then remove the pack and then examine the wound. Post-operative pain related to infection is accompanied by usually localized lymphadenopathy or regional localized lymphadenopathy and a slight elevation in temperature, which is treated with systemic antibiotics and analgesics. Now that would complete so uh, your entire topic on general principles of periodontal surgery. So you always consider 
the importance of following the principles before you can go ahead with the surgical protocol. So the more better you follow the pro, uh, protocol, the better would be the, your, uh, your patient getting a lot of benefits. Thank you.